Bob Cusack back with Mark Penn. And as we always do in our monthly segments, uh, Mark, what is the one word that summarizes your most recent fresh polling data? University. Okay, why is that? Well, because universities are in hot water. Uh, the, the kids that are going through the universities uh, certainly uh, don't have the same kinds of values that I think older Americans have today. University presidents are on the hot seat uh, and uh, Americans are really concerned about it. And if striking numbers, I mean, 68% believe anti-Semitism uh, is on college campuses, basically, and that's a high number maybe not surprising. Um, and also you had the, the testi uh, testimony from really tone deaf university presidents. Um, that took a life on its own, right? I mean, that got a lot of attention. I imagine a lot of the people who responded uh, to your polling, they're very well aware of this issue. Well, most people in the country uh, either saw or heard about the testimony, which is incredible for you know, a few minutes of kind of congressional testimony that kind of happens every day. I mean, this just struck a nerve. How is it that the most learned, scholarly heads of institutions could possibly hesitate when asked whether uh, gen someone calling for the genocide for, for Jews uh, is uh, in violation of university conduct rules. Like, yeah, that's okay, no problem. Well, they didn't say that's okay, no problem. But the truth is, almost like if you remember politically, uh, Dukakis sunk his career when asked about, uh, uh, you know, what would you do if your wife was raped? And he, he didn't have an emotional answer. And what happened is that these university presidents didn't really have good statements on October 7th, and then when it came to this congressional testimony, didn't have immediate uh, heartfelt statements about actions they would take if people were calling on their campuses for genocide to Jews. Mm. Well, and let's a lot of stuff to tackle. Uh, let's start with the good news for President Biden. Uh, you've been tracking a question for a while. How strong is the economy? And over the last several months, it's gone from 38% think it's strong to now 44%. We are seeing some economic data, uh, whether that's interest rates dropping, inflation dropping, gas prices dropping, uh, stock market at, at hitting record highs. Um, but still, uh, that's, that's the good news uh, for Biden. Uh, but his approval rating is 43%. That's not great. And Trump is beating him by five points uh, in this poll. Uh, what, what's your take? Do you see any potential momentum on the economy for Biden here? Uh, I think calling that good news, Bob, is a little predictive AI. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's a possibility that he may have good news in a few months if he can kind of convince people that the economy under him really is on an even keel whereas most people still think the economy is quite negative. Uh, although there's been six points of uptick, it's still well below 50% who yep. think that the, the economy is strong. And it, you know, I've, look, I've always said, anytime somebody asks me, they say, well, these numbers are terrible for Biden. I say, look, these numbers are not good for Biden, but he has a year in which to improve them. Uh, a year is probably not, you know, he doesn't have a year anymore. Generally, people will uh, come to their final attitudes about the economy sometime during the summer. Uh, I think the State of the Union address for him could be important in terms of showing what he's going to do in the future, how he's going to deal with government spending and inflation. Uh, I think that uh, the economy is getting better. The economy, generally speaking, the stock market is the leading indicator here suggesting that the economy is going to get better. And usually the voters are a lagging indicator. And that's kind of what we see here. Well, uh, speaking of the president, uh, his son is obviously in hot water. The, uh, the House has voted uh, to launch a formal impeachment inquiry along strict party lines. Uh, 
the House, this was not easy uh, because some members on the Republican side, I don't think we're crazy about voting on it. Um, however, when you look at uh, the Hunter Biden controversy, there's been this kind of dance with House Republicans of whether he'll testify. He wants to testify in public, but they're saying Republicans are saying, hey, he's got to he's got to give us a deposition first. Uh, your your data show 81 percent. I believe Hunter should show up the deposition, even 72 percent of Democrats. And then if he doesn't, 71 percent in total say he should be prosecuted by the DOJ. What, what What's your take on these numbers? Well, I am dumbfounded by the Hunter Biden strategy. Uh, we ask his favorable, unfavorable, and he's one of the most unpopular people, far less popular than President Biden, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. Uh, he doesn't get that, uh, you know, he had these contracts with uh, foreign governments and enemies and, and uh, didn't report them and didn't pay taxes on them. And he shows zero contrition for that. And it's, it's a very understanding public for people who would show contrition. Instead, he's trying to make it into a political issue, say that this is all MAGA Republicans. And I think there's just too much information. And after all, he's been indicted twice by the Biden Justice Department. So I, I don't. And, and let me just say, I work with President Clinton. We we during, you know, Paula Jones and Monica Lewinsky, we considered not going to the depositions. And we decided that was a bad idea at the end of the day. Uh, uh -huh. Americans will let you go. They will say, well, OK, you shouldn't get this punishment. Let's take into consideration all circumstances but they like compliance. They like you to show up. And after all, depositions are a routine part of legal proceedings. There's nothing particularly unusual about them. And, and scores of people go through depositions before public testimony and court cases. All of the Trump children must have gone through 10 of them. Um, I, I, I am just dumbfounded. I, I don't see how this is a winning strategy for him or for Democrats for that matter compared to him being earnest, compliant, remorseful somewhat, uh, I, I think that that would work a lot better for him. And then I don't want to go too far in without mentioning, certainly, I don't want to bury the lead, as they say in journalism. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me is 72% of people polled say a vote for Biden is a vote for Kamala Harris. Uh, obviously, Biden's numbers are not great. Her numbers, she's underwater, too. Um, were you surprised it was that high? I mean, that's kind of a Republican talking point. But actually, a lot of people here, seven, more than 710, believe that. Yeah, I put in a bunch of agree-disagree statements with uh, a bunch of Republican and Democratic talking points. And most of the voters agreed with all of them, uh, <laughs> which really shows how conflicted the 20% who were really swing voters are. But the one question that really stood out at 72 percent was this notion that a vote for President Biden is really a vote for Vice President Harris because he's not likely to make it through a second term. And uh, I think that's a startling number. And that's why I think you're going to see the, the Trump campaign, if it's the Trump campaign or whoever the Republican nominee is, really harping on that point that it's not a vote for Joe Biden, but a vote for Vice President Harris whose numbers are a little bit better than they were, but uh, but but she would still be a, a fairly difficult candidate on her own. And going back to the economy on a second, which obviously is, is, is the top issue, um, these numbers are not good for Biden. Uh, the fact that uh, most 61 percent say they were personally better off under Trump than Biden, and as far as whether they're worse off or better off under Biden, 55% say they're worse off. Um, those numbers really have to improve. Not to say Biden has to, to be winning in that, but he's got to neutralize some of that economic advantage somehow, right? Yeah, Bob, you're exactly where I am, which is that you're not going to win the economic issue, but you can't have a 20-point gap on it, right? And you can't have everybody saying, well, I'm worse off under Biden. I was better off under Trump. And if you can neutralize the economic issue, which, again, unemployment is low, inflation is coming down, stocks are going back up. As soon as interest rates come down and if gas prices stay down, 
I think he'll be able to go out and talk about Bidenomics again, and that could be four or five months uh, away. And then if you assume, you know, that that goes in his direction, then he can go back to MAGA Republicans, threat to democracy, uh, Trump's a criminal. I put all those talking points in, too, and most people agree with those. Uh, right. And, and one of the Democratic points, uh, obviously, that most Democrats believe is that Trump committed a crime. And you've got a majority of people who think, yes, he, he did commit a crime. So you have a choice between someone who they think is too old and someone who they think committed crimes. <laughs> and, uh, and so how are they going to vote? You know, I, with the brilliance of the 2016 Trump campaign was that he successfully made that about issues like immigration, like trade, like people's, you know, uh, energy. Uh, and, and even though the voters disliked both Hillary and him, they voted on the issues. I think what happened in 2020 was he didn't really make it about the issues. He made it about him. Yeah. And if it's about him, no, well, he's not the most, you know, he's not the most fashionable, desirable candidate either. And that right. brings it very quickly to a 50-50 race, uh, no matter what the current state of the poll is, if it's, if it's, if it's just between these two personalities. And, and speaking of policy, as we speak right now, uh, there's a question of whether foreign aid is going to get done. And then uh, next month we have a potential government shutdown. All these things could be meshed together. Who knows? But Republicans, your polling data show, I mean, it, they do have an advantage on the border. Uh, 65 percent believe it's fine for Republicans to hold up a foreign policy deal uh, to get some border concessions. Um but of course, the left doesn't want Biden uh, to, to do that. What, what do you make of the politics of that? I think that the biggest issue that's shown an increase lately is immigration. That even, even in the poll, everyone underestimates by millions of people how many people have come through the border. And even with that underestimation, they think the Trump uh, immigration policies were better. Uh, and so this is one where he's also got to neutralize it and where I think Schumer is on the right path here. You know, at, the, at this point, it was never stated policy to have an open border, right? And so consequently, if the administration doesn't move here and says no to the Republicans, well, A, they want the aid for the Ukraine, which Democrats support and and you know, overall is supported and they want the aid for Israel, which overall is supported and Republicans in particular support that. Uh, but, you know, the country really wants something done about immigration and 65 percent or so are with the Republicans holding up the aid to get something for for immigration. And that makes political sense for Biden. It doesn't make sense for Biden to stick with the left on this issue considering how it's bubbled over into democratic cities uh, like New York, like Chicago, uh, and you've got mayors like New York saying, hey, you've got to do something about this issue. Going back to Trump, Trump is, uh, your poll shows, dominating uh, like, like it has in the past and other polls, dominating. He's in first, of course, 67%. DeSantis is edging Haley by a point, 11 to 10 Huge margin, but let's. What's your analysis of going into Iowa? I know we've talked before that Trump's support is strong. Uh, Haley has done. I think she's captured some momentum, but she's got a long way to go. What do you make of you know? Because the early states are going to change everything. Uh, what does Haley or DeSantis have to do? Well, first, I look at the Republican Party and I say it's the party that nominated McCain, nominated Romney frankly, that nominated Trump when Trump was not as conservative a candidate as he is today. He was the yeah. he was the outsider coming in against the conservative. So um, I think people over or underestimate the the what I call the somewhat conservative vote within the Republican primaries in the 23 states that have independent voters. I don't think Iowa really matters much. Uh, it, it hasn't really picked the winner in the Republican Party in a while. I think the winners get chosen in New Hampshire. 
And I think that independent voters there have no contest on the Democratic side. They can pick who they want to vote for. If, if Haley or DeSantis has a really good operation in New Hampshire, and she's picked up the critical endorsement from Sununu, if she comes in a strong second in New Hampshire, it's a new ball game going into South Carolina. But mostly she's got to get to some of these bigger states where, where suburban women voters really are the ones who decide. And if she can have a credible campaign coming out of New Hampshire and South Carolina, I would not, I think that very quickly the probabilities will go from 75% Trump to 50% Trump. And, and let's see what happens. As I mentioned earlier, Trump is up five on, on the president. Uh, but and then you add the third parties and you did it in different ways. Trump's still up. He's still up. He's actually he's up by more. He's up by eight points, uh, depending on how you slice it and who, who you put in the poll. Uh, what does that tell you? Uh, I, I don't think it tells me much right now because because, the, the, you, you know, there isn't a real third party choice that's really well known. I, overall, I think, uh, you know, close to, if I remember, about 60 percent or so say that they would go with a moderate alternative against these two. And so whether or not that develops or not, and how strong it develops, I, I do think there are a lot of voters that could defect both of these candidates. If you're if you're choosing between someone who's too old, who's not really, you think, going to be the president and somebody you think should be behind bars, that there, there is an opening here, especially if you're if you're discontented about the economy, immigration and crime uh, and about government generally. So, uh, you know, we're going to just have to wait and let things develop a little bit more here. Um, I think the 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 ingredients are there for some really strange really strange things. But Trump is coming in here with a strong edge. Biden is weak. He's Biden is stronger in my poll than in a lot of other polls. Some have him, you know, in the 30s in his job rating. You know, right. we, I think because we do voters and I think I think voters are a little bit more uh, partial to people from their own party. I think we show a higher number than than polls that just do adults show. You mentioned crime, and, and crime was an issue that worked for Republicans, but not uh, not nationally in terms. Certainly worked in New York uh, and maybe some other places. What, what do you think? How big a a, a role is crime going to play as, as a policy when people go to the polls in a year? Uh, you know, hard to say. I don't think it's going to be as big an issue as immigration because really the increase in interest that we see in crime is in strong democratic areas because the real increases in crime have been in cities and so you know if in fact as some again as some of the polls show minority voters start to defect from uh from the democrats crime might be the issue on which they defect right uh -huh. the economy the cost of living uh, crime might be the issues that, that motivate those voters. I'm a little doubtful. I tend to think that they're going to come home to the Democrats. They consistently have, you know, unless, you know, somebody here runs a really good campaign. Uh -huh. uh, are there other sleeper issues that you think people should be watching? Because, you know, it's a long way for the election. We're still a month away from Iowa. A lot can happen in just a month, much less a year. Well, look, abortion, reproductive rights is still a very strong issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that foreign policy could be something more of an issue. You know, we're a long way from the days of the Nixon-Kennedy debates that were primarily about foreign policy. And it's fascinating to me when I took a small uh, subset of the core issues of the country that only 2% said that Israel was the most important issue. So um, so definitely a lot of things are playing out in terms of the Ukraine and Israel, but Americans right now are very focused on the homeland, right? Keeping the homeland secure, having borders, bringing down inflation. But I don't know what that will be six months from now. I don't know what that would be if there's a terrorist incident of some kind on this shore. Things like that can change on a dime and, 
And so I'm so so sleeper cells could be the sleeper issue. On, on Ukraine aid, um, you know, uh, Zelensky was in town this week. Uh, uh, I got to interview him with a small group of reporters when he visited the last time. Very impressive in person. But uh, this effort seems to be losing steam. Do you think that's part, part of the reason is because it's losing some steam with the American public? I think the American public is, is very supportive of the Ukraine. I think we have uh -huh. 65% support. I think they just don't want a $60 billion bill. Uh, I, I think that they've spent a lot of money. I think they spent about $40 billion so far. And $100 billion is, is, a, is a lot to spend at a time when inflation has been kicked off by government spending and people are trying to control government spending somewhat. So I just think, you know, the, the bill for Israel is only $14 billion. And even that's, you know, got fifty four forty six. even though there's huge support, you know, for Israel throughout the electorate. So $60 billion for the Ukraine is, is a big number. I think, you know, the president would have done better coming in with a, with a smaller number. And even though Republicans are driving the debate on the border and immigration, uh, they could also be helping Biden a little bit, too, if he agrees to, to, to concede on the border, right? Well, absolutely. That's why, you know, the, the, the primary strategy we did, you know, was to make deals with the Republicans, and that would help us, and it would help the Republicans in Congress, and it wouldn't be great for the Democrats in Congress. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you're Biden right now, you're looking, you're saying, look, the, the congressional Democrats have done okay. You really need me to do better because I'm at the top of the ticket and maybe doing a deal here may help the Republicans a little bit, may, but it really will help me. And that's really going to help you. So there's a, there's a logic here at this one, at this particular moment. Um, and I would be surprised if, uh, particularly considering Schumer, who sees that logic, I would be surprised if ultimately the administration didn't uh, strike a compromise. Uh, who do you think wins? Uh, the party that try to, tries to get its base out in November 2024, or the party that, I mean, obviously the parties want to do both, but the party that is more effective in courting independence? Um, I think that if this is going to be about... Uh, who gets the independent voter. I think that, that both parties, and particularly the Democrats, have already milked the voter turnout thing pretty heavily. And I'm not sure they can get a lot more voters out than, 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 than they've gotten, although you know there are more uh, unregistered uh, young men than there are uh, you know, unregistered other types. But, uh, but I, I, just, I just don't see that they're going to be able to put a push that is going to get them anything more. So I do think it's going to come down to these swing voters and particularly these independent swing voters. Suburban women are going to play, you know, the ultimate uh, choosers, I think, of the election. Uh, and I think that it is time these candidates spent a little more time looking at who those swing voters were and get out of base politics because, uh, uh, I mean, look, somebody's going to win regardless, but, uh, but I don't think that's the best way to win, and I think it'll put them in some danger. Well, it's getting real, Mark. Uh, we're about to head into a very exciting election year. Expect the unexpected. Uh, your thoughts as we head into 2024, closing thoughts, anything maybe I didn't mention? No, I think that, um, that expect the unexpected is right, that we always think it's, you know, it's very clear, and you go into these primaries, and, the, you know, it's like I'll never forget my very first poll that I did right in uh, for the New York State Democratic Party. And we're doing this poll and uh, I look at the questionnaire and we're in the field and I go up to my partner and say, you know, we've got to stop the poll. And he says, why? I said, well, we've left out one of the presidential candidates. And uh, he says, well, which one? And I say, well, it's Jimmy Carter. And he says, ah, forget about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you never know, right? You never know. Exactly. Well, and that, that is definitely a theme going into 2024. Enjoy the holidays, Mark, and we'll be back uh, next month in the election year to talk more politics and more polling. Thanks, Bob.